So this is the first part of blood vessels. So blood vessels are the vessels that which blood is contained in. And actually blood stays in these blood vessels all the time. Humans have what's called a closed circulatory system. In other words, the blood is always contained in these blood vessels and it never leaves the blood vessels unless you have some sort of injury. And if you look at it, it travels these pathways. Well, it travels in what are called circuits. Circuits are the same word as circles. So we don't just have one circuit though, we actually have two. So here is a circle and here is a circle. And it looks a little bit like a figure eight with a heart right in the middle. So we have two circles or circuits. So one of these circuits is called the systemic circuit. So the systemic circuit is the uh, part of the heart that pumps out to your tissues. So it's the left side of the heart, and we've already talked about the heart, and you should remember that the left side of the heart has a much thicker ventricle, and it's going to pump with a much higher pressure, and that pressure is going to allow us to go against gravity so we can pump blood up to your head, and then also long distance, all the way out to your fingers and your toes, long distance. And what's going to happen when we get there is we're going to drop off oxygen and we're going to pick up carbon dioxide. The blood changes color. And then we're going to go back to the right side of the heart. If we look at this other circuit, this is the pulmonary circuit. And so the pulmonary circuit is going to send blood to the lungs. And so it's all about the right side of the heart. So the right side of the heart is a pump into the pulmonary circulation. And hopefully you remember that the right side of the heart, the ventricle is much, much thinner. Well, remember the reason it's thinner is because we don't need as much pressure. The lungs are very close to the heart. And remember the lungs are filled with air and so they have very little resistance. And so you can have a thinner walled ventricle. And so the pressure on this side is much, much lower. So the right ventricle is going to pump blood to the lungs. And when it gets to the lungs, what we're going to do is drop off carbon dioxide and we're going to pick up oxygen. And then the blood is going to come back to the left side of the heart. So if we look at these in just a little bit more detail, Let's look at the pulmonary circulation first. And so here you can see this circle. There it is right there. And so again, we're going to do the right side out to the lungs, drop off carbon dioxide, pick up oxygen, come back to the left side. And these are the vests that we're going to go through. Now we're going to talk about some of these a little bit later on. If you look at the systemic circulation, Remember the systemic circulation, we're going to send blood from the left side of the heart out to your other tissues. So up to your head, out to your arms, your legs. And again, we're going to come back to the right side of the heart. And these are the vessels that we're going to go through in order to do that. And again, we'll talk about some of these a little bit later on. So two circuits. Again, pulmonary circuit systemic circuit. And remember the heart is really sort of two pumps. And so one of those pumps is part of the systemic circulation. One of those pumps is part of the pulmonary circulation. So let's look at the vessels themselves. One type of blood vessel that we have are called arteries. Now, most of us, if we were to look at this picture, we would just say all the red things are arteries. But that's not actually true. What makes an artery an artery is that it carries blood away from the chambers of the heart. And it's easy to remember because artery starts with an A and away starts with an A. So A, A. So all arteries carry blood away from the chambers of the heart. 
but not all arteries are red because red does not mean artery. What red means is that the blood inside the artery, or sorry, inside the vessel is oxygenated. It has oxygen in it. And when you add oxygen to blood, it turns bright, bright, bright red, almost a scarlet color. And so we use this red color to represent oxygenated blood. And so if you see red, it doesn't tell you if it's an artery or vein. It tells you whether or not the blood is oxygenated. Remember, arteries carry blood away from the heart. So yes, this artery has got red blood in it, so it's carrying oxygenated blood. But look, this is an artery also because it's carrying blood away from the heart. And look, it's blue. Blue we use to represent deoxygenated blood. And deoxygenated blood is just lower in oxygen and it does indeed change color, but it's never blue. We just use this as a color to designate it. It's sort of a dark, rusty red, but it's not bright red. And so if we look at the vessels that are arteries and they're carrying oxygenated blood, those are the systemic arteries. So those are part of the systemic circulation. If we look at the arteries that are carrying deoxygenated blood, those are the pulmonary arteries. So they're a part of this pulmonary circulation. Now umbilical arteries, which we find in the fetus and the pregnant mother, those also carry deoxygenated blood, and so they're also colored blue. So here's our systemic arteries, here's our pulmonary arteries. Another vessel type that we have are veins. So veins carry blood toward the chambers of the heart toward the chambers of the heart. And again, most of us, if we were to just look at this picture, we would just say all the blue things are veins. But remember, that's not true. Because blue does not mean vein. Blue means deoxygenated blood. And so, yes, a lot of veins carry deoxygenated blood. Look, they're going toward the heart, so it's definitely a vein. And they're blue, so it's deoxygenated. But these are also veins. And look, they're carrying blood toward the heart, but the blood is not blue, it's red. So if we look at these, these are also veins, but the uh, blood is oxygenated. And so, when we talk about veins, the ones that are blue are part of the systemic circulation. So those are systemic veins. The ones that are red are part of this pulmonary circulation. So those are pulmonary veins. And again, if we look at the fetus and the pregnant uh, female, umbilical veins are also carrying oxygenated blood, and so they're also colored red. So when you look at this, you need to look for two things. First of all, you need to look at the arrow to see which direction the blood is going. And then we need to look at the color to see whether or not the blood is oxygenated or deoxygenated. And then finally, another type of blood vessel are capillaries. So capillaries are these very, very tiny blood vessels. They're only one cell layer thick. So that means they're very, very, very thin. And since they're so thin, the cells are in very close contact with the blood. And so what happens is we're going to get diffusion. We're going to get gas exchange and nutrient exchange. And remember, diffusion only works from high to low. And so as the blood goes through here, if the oxygen is higher in the blood, it's going to leave and go to the cells. If the carbon dioxide is higher in the cells, it's going to leave and go into the blood. 
We're going to get gas exchange and nutrient exchange and waste exchange. So in reality, of all the blood vessels, these are the most important because this is where what the blood is all about. This is where it happens. And so physiologically, these are the most important of these different blood vessels. The others are mostly just pipes. They're just a way to get the blood here so that this exchange can happen. Well, if we look at capillaries, which we just did, remember capillaries are one cell layer thick, just one cell layer. It's a single layered epithelium, and the epithelium is simple squamous. So hopefully from 2401, you remember simple squamous. If we look at simple squamous cells from the top, they look like this. They look like a fried egg. And so if you take that fried egg and look at it from the side, it looks like this. It's very, very, very thin. And that's exactly the way these cells are. And they're lined up end to end to end like this. And they form the walls of the vessel. And so you can see just how thin the walls of this vessel are. And so it's easy for oxygen and carbon dioxide to move through there. It's easy for nutrients and waste products to move through there. So just one layer. That's not true for arteries and veins. Arteries and veins have three layers, three walls. They're called tunics. The word tunic means coat. So they have three coats or three layers or three walls. Well, they're named very easily. So here's this word tunic. And they're the tunica interna. So interna means inside. So this is the one that's right next to the blood. There's the tunica media. Media just means middle. This is the middle or center layer. And then tunica externa. And externa means the outside. So this is the outside layer. And then there's a hollow space in the middle of all these blood vessels. That hollow space is called the lumen. And that's where the blood is found. So this is central space that contains the blood. So if we look at a capillary, there's that thin layer right there. And again, look at them. They look like fried eggs. And if we look at them from the side right here, you can see just how thin these are. Now they also have a basement membrane because all epithelial tissues have a basement membrane, and that's what that is. But these are not, the basement membrane is not cells. It's sort of like a layer of sort of like glue that kind of holds things together. That's the basement membrane. If we look at the artery or the vein, you can see three layers. So here is that tunica interna. That and this are exactly the same. So the tunica interna here and here is the same as the tissue here. So it's a single layer of simple squamous epithelium. And this tunica interna is very, very, very smooth. And so blood moves through here. It is always in contact with this simple squamous epithelium. And so the cells, as they go through here, all they touch is this very smooth, simple squamous epithelium. As it moves through here, all they touch is this. And it's important that it's smooth because that is what makes it not clot. If blood encounters a rough surface, it forms a clot. And we wouldn't want moving through the blood vessels to just randomly clot. And so this tissue runs throughout the circulatory system, even inside the heart. And we've already talked about the heart. Remember the inside of the heart 
there's a layer in there, which is the endocardium. Well, the endocardium is exactly the same kind of tissue as this. And this layer is called the endothelium. So again, same sort of tissue, this simple squamous epithelium. And then, remember, arteries and veins have three layers. So we don't just have this tunica interna, that endothelium. We also have a tunica media and a tunica externa. Same thing for arteries. Here's our tunica interna, that endothelium. Here's our tunica media, and there's the tunica externa. Three layers, three tunics. Anybody have any questions? Well, we're going to look at these layers individually. But before we do, look, here's a photomicrograph. In other words, it's a real picture. And here's an artery, and here's a vein. Well, if we look at these, we should be able to pick out the layers. Look, that's the externa, this blue sort of layer. There's the media, this red, this pink sort of layer. And then if you look right here, you'll see a little ruffled line. It looks a little bit like this. It's very thin. It looks like someone just sort of outlined it with an ink pen or something. That is the tunica interna. And so it's a good place for you to see just how thin this layer is. Remember, it's just a single layer. It's simple squamous epithelium. So that's what the artery looks like. Look at a vein. We have the same three layers. So here is our tunica externa. There's the tunica media. And in an artery, this tunica interna is not ruffled. It's flat like this. But again, you can see just how thin it is. Anybody have any questions? And then, of course, remember, there's a hollow space where the blood is located, and that hollow space is called the lumen. There's the lumen over here. You might also notice something different about arteries and veins. There's no blood in here. They're empty. It's been taken out. But an artery, when it's empty, tends to stay round to stay round. The walls are stiff enough, they're strong enough that they stay round. But look what happens when you take the blood out of a vein. The walls are much, much thinner, much, much weaker, and so the vein tends to collapse in on itself. And so they don't look round generally in a photomicrograph. So here's an artery. There's the lumen right there. There's blood. You can see the blood in there. And then hopefully you can see the three layers. So there's the externa. There's the media. And there's the interna. And then if we look at a vein, look, it looks less round. Now there's still some blood in here. Otherwise it would collapse even more. But there's the externa. There's the media, and that little dark line right there, that's the interna. Here's another view, same thing. There's an artery here, a vein here, and I hope that you can pick out the layers. Now, externa is also called adventitia. This is a little bit older name, but was still used. And interna is sometimes called Intima, an old name, but still used. But look, round does not collapse. But look, this one folds in on itself. It collapses. Now this over here is a nerve. That's not a blood vessel. But nerves often run alongside arteries and veins. So look at these three layers. Let's look at the outer layer first. 
So again, this is the tunica externa. And again, it's sometimes called adventitia, but it's kind of an old name and it's sort of going away. Well, if you look at this tunica interna, it's connective tissue. And the connective tissue that it's made out of is elastic connective tissue. So from a and P1, you should remember elastic connective tissue has these elastin fibers or elastic fibers. And a good way to think of those is to think of them like little rubber bands. And if you think about rubber bands, they can stretch. So if you stretch a rubber band, what you've done is you've stored energy in it. Then when you let go of it, that rubber band tends to go back to its original length. And so not only do we have stretch with a rubber band, with an elastic fiber, we also have recoil. So the more of this tissue you have, the more stretch and recoil you have. Now there's also collagen in here. A lot of collagen. And remember, collagen is very, very, very strong. It's strong. And so that's what gives the vessel its strength. So collagen reinforces the wall of the vessel and protects the wall of the vessel and so on. So when we look at it, we can see there's the tunica externa. There's the tunica externa. You might also notice that there are little blue and red things in here. Well, here's where the blood is. It's in here. And remember, gas exchange happens by diffusion. And that's just too far for diffusion to happen. So larger blood vessels have their own even smaller, tiny little blood vessels inside the wall. They're basically just these capillaries but they're in here. They have a name. They're called the Vasa Vasorum. So those are the capillaries located in the walls of the vest, and they're found in the tunica externa. And they're there to supply oxygen and nutrients to the cells of the artery, the cells of the vein. We don't have that in these little tiny capillaries or tiny blood vessels because the remember the blood is here and it's not far enough that diffusion can't happen. Let's look at the tunica media. So remember media means middle, so it's the one in the middle. It's not connective tissue. It's smooth muscle. Now there is some elastic fibers in here but it's smooth muscle. So hopefully you remember smooth muscle looks a little bit like a canoe or a kayak. And remember they overlap each other like this. And so when you look at them, they have wide middles and tapered ends. And so if we let them here, that's what we're seeing right there. That's smooth muscle. And you can see it over here as well. That's smooth muscle. Well, when you have smooth muscle, remember muscle can contract. Well, the muscle fibers are arranged around the blood vessel in a circle like this. So we have this layer of smooth muscle inside there in the middle layer, this tunica media. Well, if you contract that, what's going to happen is the walls are going to squeeze in. The walls are going to squeeze in like this. And what's going to happen is the internal diameter is going to get smaller. So it'll look like that. So look, if I see how much space there is in this one. Look, the size of this lumen is this big. But if I look here, the size of the lumen is only that big. Well, which one of these do you think that more blood vessels or more blood could go through, A or B? Yeah, A, of course. So more blood can go through here 
then through here. Well, remember this is a contraction. Another way of contra saying contraction is constriction. And because it's in a blood vessel, we put vaso in front of it. So if we look at it, we get vasoconstriction, and that's what's happened right here. But look, we can not only go in this direction, we can go in this direction. The muscles can relax, and when they relax, the internal diameter gets bigger. It gets bigger than it did before. In other words, it dilates. And again, we're going to put this word vaso in front of it. So we have vasoconstriction and vasodilation. And the more muscle you have, the more smooth muscle you have, the better you are at doing vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Make sense? Well, look at this. Here is that layer in an artery. Look how thick that layer is. It goes from here to here. But here is that layer in a vein. And look how thick it is. It goes from here to here. So it should be obvious that arteries have more smooth muscle. And if you have more smooth muscle, that means you're better at doing vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Veins have very little smooth muscle. They don't have hardly any at all, and which means they're not good at doing vasoconstriction and vasodilation. So the thickness of this tunica media, how much smooth muscle you have, is going to determine how good you are at doing vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Let's look at the tunica interna. Remember, it's also called tunica intima. And remember, it's just endothelium. It's one cell layer thick. And remember that one cell is simple squamous epithelium. And simple squamous epithelium is very, very, very thin. And so it's easy for diffusion to happen if in these vessels. So when we look at it, there you can see these fried egg looking cells and again very very thin another thing about capillaries is they are tiny they're tiny 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 vessels they're microscopic they're so small in diameter that red blood cells have to go through them one at a time so they have to go through them in single file, one right after the other, one right after the other. But they can't go through in any other way. These capillaries are about 8 microns in diameter. And a red blood cell is also about 8 microns in diameter. And then remember, we have capillaries. We have a ton of them. There are so many capillaries that there are no cells in your body that are more than two or three cells away from a capillary. That's how many we have. And because we have so many capillaries, if we were to lay them end to end to end to end, and a normal sized person who weighs about 120 pounds, that person, if we laid all of their blood vessels end to end to end, they have about 66,000 miles of blood vessels. 
66,000 miles of blood vessels, which is just kind of crazy when you think about it. But that's because there's so many capillaries. Whenever you gain body weight, whenever you grow in any way, we're going to increase the number of capillaries. And then when you lose body weight, the exact same thing is going to happen. We're going to lose capillaries. So if you don't weigh 120 pounds, let's say you weigh 180 pounds, you have a ton more capillaries. Any questions? Okay. Well, let's look at these arteries. They all look like this. They all have three layers. But arteries are different. There are three different kinds of arteries. There are elastic arteries, which are also called conducting. There are muscular arteries, which are also called distributing. <clears throat> and then there are arterioles. So let's look at elastic arteries first. Remember, they're also called conducting. So elastic arteries are the largest arteries, the very biggest arteries. Now, the largest artery in your whole body is the aorta, but it's not just the aorta. It's also the brachiocephalic. It's also the subclavians. It's also the iliacs, the femorals, the brachial. So there's a bunch of these elastic arteries, but they're huge. They have a very large lumen, which means that very little of the blood is actually in contact with the wall. And because of that, there's very little friction associated with them. And so there's very little resistance. And so the blood just flows through here very, very easily. And so the blood just zooms through here. And that's why they're called conducting arteries, because it just zooms and they conduct the uh, blood like crazy. The most important thing about elastic arteries, though, is that they have elastin. And they have a lot of elastin. They have elastin in all three layers. And you can see it. It forms these internal and external lamina. So if we look here at this artery, this is an elastic artery. And look, there is a layer of elastin. It looks like Swiss cheese, sort of. And there's a layer of elastin. So this is our internal elastic lamina, and this is our external elastic lamina. Well, the more elastin you have, remember elastin is like rubber bands. So the more you have of it, the more stretchy you are. And so these arteries are very, very stretchy, but they don't just have stretch. Remember, they have recoil. And that's important. When blood gets pushed to one of these arteries, we're forcing blood in it. And it's pushing against the walls. Well, what's going to happen is the walls are going to bulge out. So the walls are going to expand because of this force. And it's like stretching a rubber band. Well, that happens when the heart is in systole. It's when it's contracting. But the heart doesn't just contract. Remember, it also relaxes. It goes into diastole. And as soon as it goes into diastole, this pressure is going to disappear. So now those walls, which were bulged out, which were stretched like rubber bands, they're going to come back to their original position. They're going to squeeze in. 
And what they're going to do as they squeeze in is they're going to apply pressure to the blood. So the blood is going to get pressure from the heart when it's beating, but it's going to get pressure from these arteries in between beats. And so what that's going to do is that's going to can make the blood continue to flow because it's being squeezed by these walls of these arteries. And so if you remember back to our Wiggers diagram, everybody remember it? It looks like this. And we said that there were pressures. Measure them in millimeters of mercury. And remember there were three pressures that we looked at. There was atrial pressure, which was way down here, very small. But then there was ventricular pressure. And remember, ventricular pressure goes all the way up to about 120, and it goes all the way back down. So look, there's a huge fluctuation in pressure here. 120 back down to zero. Back up to 120, back down to zero. So if we were to graph that, which is kind of what this is, look, it looks like this. It goes huge fluctuations in pressure. But there was a third pressure that we looked at, and that was the pressure in the aorta. And remember, the aortic pressure does go up and down, but it doesn't go down nearly as much as it does in the ventricle. In fact, it goes up to about 120, but it only drops to about 80. Well, the reason for that is those rubber bands. So we don't get these huge fluctuations. We get smaller fluctuations. And so it smooths out these large blood pressure fluctuations. It applies pressure to the blood. And so sometimes these arteries are called pressure reservoirs. In other words, they absorb pressure from the ventricle and then they store it until the ventricle relaxes and then they return the pressure to the blood when the heart is relaxed. Any questions? So those are elastic arteries. We also, though, have smaller arteries. So look, there's a smaller artery right there. And smaller arteries are of a different type. The smaller arteries, well, before we do that, let's look at those layers. So remember, there's externa, there's media, and there's interna. Well, we can see that here. Here's our elastic artery. There's externa. There's media. There's interna. And if we come over here and look at what it's made out of, look, all arteries, capillaries, veins, everything's going to have an endothelium. That's never going to change. But these other things do change. And if we look at the elastic artery, what it has more of than any other artery is the elastic connective tissue. It has a lot more. So, when you have more of this, you have more stretch, and you have more recoil. Make sense? Any questions? Well, let's look at one. So, these are real arteries. Looking at them under a microscope, and remember when we looked, when we talked about 2401, we said that elastin, when you look at it, it looks like a hair, and they stain dark, generally. So look in here, and you'll see a lot of little squiggly lines, a lot of little hair-like structures in there, tons of them. That is that elastin. 
You can sit here in this one. There's the elastin. There's the elastin. There's the elastin. So there's a ton of this elastic fibers. Look over here. All of these wiggly lines that you see, that's elastin. So elastic arteries have a lot of elastic fibers. Okay, let's look at another type of artery. So the smaller arteries are what are called muscular arteries. They're also called distributing arteries. So if you look at muscular arteries, when you look at them, they're different. Now they're going to be past the elastic arteries and basically go to organs. So if I look at this artery, it's a mid-sized or small artery. It's going, say, I don't know, to the stomach. But there's another artery that's going, say, to skeletal muscles. Well, think about stomach versus skeletal muscles. The stomach is all about eating. It's all about food. It's all that kind of stuff. It has to contract to mix up the food so you can digest it. But skeletal muscles are all about things like movement, exercise, and all that. Well, when one of these tissues, one of these organs is active, it's going to need more blood. But we don't have enough blood to fill up all of our blood vessels at the same time. Remember, we have 66,000 miles of blood vessels. And so we have to choose where the blood goes. So we choose based on their activity level. So if a tissue or an organ is more active, we send it more blood. Well, the only way we can do that is to choose the, where the blood goes. Well, how do we do it? We do it by vasoconstriction and vasodilation. So remember we talked about this. We said that if you vasodilate, the lumen is bigger. If you vasoconstrict, the lumen is smaller. And so what's going to happen? Let's say I'm exercising. Well, if I'm exercising, where do you think I want my blood to go? Do I want it to go to my stomach? Or do you think I want it to go to my skeletal muscles? Sure, we want it to go to our skeletal muscles. So what do you think is going to happen to the blood vessels that go to the skeletal muscles? Are they going to vasoconstrict or vasodilate? They're going to do this. They're going to vasodilate. So what's going to happen to those blood vessels is they're going to open up. They're going to, the muscle's going to relax and they're going to open up so that lots and lots and lots of blood can go to the skeletal muscles. So when I'm exercising, that's what needs to happen. So this artery will vasodilate. Well, remember, I don't have enough blood to fill up all my blood vessels, so this artery is going to have to vasoconstrict. But what happens after the exercise is over and I go home and I decide I want to have a snack? Well, now my muscles are doing anything. I don't need all that blood going to the muscles. But my stomach, as I fill it up with food, I need it to digest the food. I'm going to need more blood going to the stomach. So what's going to happen is I'm going to shift that blood. So the blood going to the muscles, I'm going to vasoconstrict these blood vessels. And when you vasoconstrict, there's going to be less blood going to my muscles. They're not active anymore. But my stomach is working very hard. And so I'm going to vasodilate those blood vessels so that more blood can now go to my stomach. And so I'm constantly doing vasoconstriction and vasodilation. It happens all the time. Well, the only way I can do that is if I have muscle. And so if you look at muscular arteries, they have a very thick tunica media, 
and they have a lot more smooth muscle. And so they're very, very active. They're very good at doing vasoconstriction and vasodilation. And because of that, I get to choose where the blood is going to go. So I can choose if it's going to go to muscles. I can choose if it's going to go to the stomach. And so I can distribute my blood. And that's why they're called distributing arteries. So if I look at one of those, remember they're going to be mid-sized arteries, not these big, big arteries. They're mid-sized and small arteries. So this is a pretty good representation of it. And so look, there's a thick layer here. Let's look at them in particular. So there was our elastic artery. Here's our muscular layer. I mean muscular artery. Look, there's the externa. There's the media. Look how thick that media is. It's much thicker than that one up there. And if we look at it in terms of the tissue makeup, look how much more muscle this muscular artery has than any other artery type. Does not have as much elastin, so it's not as stretchy. If we look at that under a microscope, look, see how thick this layer is? That's the tunica media right there. Look how thick this layer is. That's the tunica media. That's the tunica media. And so a lot of smooth muscle. And so again, they're going to be very good at doing vasoconstriction and vasodilation. We also have very, very, very small arteries. So the very smallest arteries are called arterioles. So arterioles are tiny. And what they do is they lead into capillaries. So that means that on one side, there's an artery. And remember, arteries have three layers. There's a tunica externa, a tunica media, a tunica interna. On the other side of the arteriole is a capillary. And remember, capillaries only have one layer. The only layer they have is the tunica interna. So I go from three layers down to one layer. And so arterioles sort of are in between there. And so they're a little bit like adapter vessels. On this end, they look more like an artery. And on this end, they look more like a capillary. So what happens with an arteriole is we lose a layer. So here's three, there's one. Arterioles have two layers, just two layers. So they lose a layer. And the layer they lose is the tunica externa. They don't have a tunica externa. Which means they're not stretchy at all. What they do have, these two layers, they have a tunica interna, just like all blood vessels do, and then they still have the tunica media. And the tunica media, remember, is where smooth muscle is located. And so they still have quite a bit of smooth muscle. And remember, smooth muscle allows us to change the diameter of the lumen. We can vasodilate and we can vasoconstrict. And that happens right here. We're still going to be doing vasoconstriction, vasodilation. Another thing that happens here is if you look at this, it looks a little bit like a highway system. So look over here. This is like a highway that, I don't know, has eight lanes. Down here, I don't know, there's some sort of construction going on here. We're down to two lanes. So think about if you're in, in your car and you're driving and there's a lot of traffic 
Think about what's going to happen when you get here. All of this traffic, which was on eight lanes, is now got to somehow squeeze in to the, down to this one lane. So in this area right here, where there's a lot of merging going on, think about what happens to that traffic. It slows down. It slows down because the resistance to movement, the resistance to flow goes up. And so these vessels are sometimes called resistance vessels. And they're going to contribute to something we see later on called peripheral resistance. Now that's in another lecture but they're going to increase peripheral resistance. They're going to increase resistance. So here's what those look like. They're these little tiny things right here that lead to these capillaries. These are the arterioles. So if we look at an arteriole, they're tiny. They're tiny. So here's an artery over here. Here's an arteriole. So remember, arterioles only have two layers. So there's our tunica interna. All blood vessels have that. And then here's our tunica media. And this is smooth muscle right here. And again, look, it goes in a circle around the blood vessel. And so when it contracts, we're going to change the internal diameter. So if we look at an arteriole, there's our little tunica interna, very, very thin. Here is the tunica media. So that's where the smooth muscle is. And then there's no other layer. Look, there's no tunica externa. And you can see the same things over here. These are also arterioles. So if we look at our diagram of an arteriole, they look like this. So again, there's the tunica interna. All of them have that. And then here's our tunica media right here. And look, you can see lots of smooth muscle. But there's no covering around it. Look, there's no outer layer like we have here and have here. So remember, there's no tunica externa. Now, we still have a little bit of elastic connective tissue. You can see it a little bit. But it's spread out among these layers. And then we can see that we still have muscle. There's also collagen. Again, that gives it strength. Let's look at capillaries. So remember we said capillaries over and over. They're tiny, tiny, tiny blood vessels. One layer thick. One cell layer thick. And remember it's simple squamous epithelium. Don't forget they're so small that blood cells have to pass through one at a time, just one. Well, not all capillaries are the same. There's actually three different kinds of capillaries, like we had three different type of arteries. There are continuous capillaries, fenestrated capillaries, and sinusoids. So here is a capillary. This one is one of those continuous capillaries. So when you look at it, again, thin, thin, thin. But you don't just have one capillary. Capillaries come in beds. So this whole thing is a capillary bed. And so there's somewhere between 10 and maybe 100 capillaries in a capillary bed. But let's look at these individual capillaries. There's our bed. And then here are individual capillaries. Look how thin the walls are. Right there, that thin, thin, thin wall. 
it, these are capillaries right here. Again, look at that thin, thin layer. And so it's obvious or easy to tell that you could get diffusion going on. So movement of materials in and out is very easy. And that material that moving in and out is going to nourish these other cells. And so remember there are no cells that are more than two or three cells away from a capillary. So look, there's a capillary, there's a capillary, there's a capillary. They're everywhere. These are all capillaries, tons of them. And again, if I add up all of the, the blood vessels end to end to end, I'm going to come up with about 66,000 miles in a regular size or about a 120-pound person. Well, let's look at the three types. Let's look at continuous capillaries first. So look at this word, continuous. That means there are no breaks. They're continuous. Their cells are end to end to end to end. So there's a cell, and there's a cell, and there's a cell. End to end to end. And the cells have tight junctions between them. They have tight junctions. And so that means that nothing can get down in between the capillaries. A good way to think of a tight junction is to think like a zipper. They're zipped up. So there's a zipper right here and here and here. So when we look at them, they look like this. So there's that tight junction right there. There's a tight junction right there. And look, there are no breaks. They're continuous. We have a lot of this type in places like the skin, muscles, also around the brain. And back in AMP1, we talked about the blood-brain barrier. Remember, there's another layer around it that's produced by astrocytes. Now, we can't see astrocytes in this picture, but here's the capillary. The astrocyte would be around that to form this other layer. So the only way in or out of this capillary is to go through the wall now, it's not a very far distance. Look, it's only that far. So diffusion can happen easily, but only small things. Only small things can diffuse across the wall. That would include things like oxygen and carbon dioxide and water. Anything very, very, very small. Look, there's a red blood cell, and there's our capillary, and you can see why they have to go through one at a time. Let's look at another type. These are called fenestrated. So fenestrated, they have holes. The word fenestration actually means windows. So they have like little windows, little holes. A better name for them might be pores. When you look at them, they have these holes, these pores. That means they're going to be more permeable than other capillaries. They're more leaky than the capillaries we just saw. And they look like this. So look, here are those fenestrations. They're holes. So now... Bigger things can get in and out of this cell because they can go through the holes. So they can get in and they can get out. And if you look at this, it should remind you of something you might have in your kitchen, a strainer or a colander. And Think about what you do with a strainer or a colander. We're going to use it to separate stuff. And that separation is based on size. 
Anything that's small enough to go through the hole will go through the hole. If it's not small enough, it won't. Well, the holes are pretty tiny. Look, there's our red blood cell. There's no way that's ever going to go through that hole. No blood cells can go through here. No platelets can go through here. But what can go through here is water, carbon dioxide, oxygen. We know that. But also things like amino acids and fatty acids and vitamins and things like that. They can go through here as well. Sugars, glucose can go through here very easily. And then the last type of capillary we have are called sinusoids. So sinusoids are very, very leaky. They have large lumens and they have huge holes, they have holes in them, not pores, holes. And so much, much bigger things can go in or out. So large molecules can go through. Things like proteins, even some blood cells can go through here, like white blood cells and platelets. They can also go through these holes. So these are very, very leaky. And you find them in places where we need big molecules either to escape or to enter. So you find them in places like the liver, the bone marrow, also some endocrine organs, because remember, hormones are being released. So when you look at them, they look like this. Look how big these holes are, huge holes. And so very, very large molecules can go out. Now, red blood cells usually don't, but white blood cells, and platelets are actually get easy to get through there. So if we look at these three types of capillaries, these are leaky. These are leakier. They're more leaky. And these are even leakier. These are the leakiest. So they all allow movement of materials, but depending on which one you're talking about, it can be more or less. Remember, we don't have one capillary. They're in beds, somewhere between 10 and 100 per bed. So when you look at them, they look like this. So here's our capillary bed right here. But remember, we have way too many blood vessels to fill up with our blood. We only have about five liters of blood. And we have this 66,000 miles of blood vessels. There's no way to fill them up. So we're going to have to pick and choose where the blood goes. We already know about distributing arteries. But capillary beds also choose. They have a little cuff of muscle the very beginning of the capillary bed. It's called a precapillary sphincter. And so precapillary sphincters, when you look at them, little cuff of smooth muscle, they're in a circle again. And remember what happens when they contract or constrict, it closes the internal diameter. Well, because these are so small, it actually closes completely. So when it closes, there's no blood that can go through there, and they look like this. So look, here those little precapillary sphincters are contracted. And look, no blood can enter the capillary. So these capillaries are empty. Now there's a word for that, whether or not capillaries are empty or full. Look at these, though. Here, they're relaxed. And so when they relax, remember, we get dilation. And so they open up so blood can flow into the capillaries. 
Well, if blood is in capillaries, these capillaries are said to be perfused. That's that word, perfused or perfusion. But look, these are empty. And so these are not or non-perfused. And so what happens is we're constantly shifting blood from one place to another. And remember, it depends on the activity level. So if I'm exercising, the capillaries in my muscles are going to be like this. They're going to be perfused. The capillaries in my stomach are going to be like this. But when I'm eating dinner or a snack, the blood vessels in my stomach are going to be like this. And the blood vessels in my muscles are going to be like this because I'm probably relaxing. I'm probably just watching TV or something. And so we're constantly choosing where the blood is going to go. Well, either way, blood has to get from the artery over to the vein so it can circulate. So if I don't let it go this way, there has to be another way for it to go. And look, there it is. It's a bypass. It's called a vascular shunt. So it's a vascular, I mean, it's blood vessels, shunt. It goes around. And there's two parts to a vascular shunt. There's this part right here. That is called a met arteriole. And then there's this part right here. That is called a thoroughfare channel. So if we look at this previous picture, it's labeled. So look, there's our vascular shunt. This a whole thing from here to here is the vascular shunt. This part right here is the met arteriole. And this part right here is the thoroughfare channel. Any questions? So if we look at it, remember we're constantly doing this back and forth, back and forth, depending on the needs of the tissue. So if I look at this, this tissue is active. I need blood to go there. This tissue is resting. It's not active. I don't need blood to go there. But depending on what it is you're doing, what activity you're doing, then it's going to switch back and forth, back and forth. Don't forget, either way, we have to have a way for the blood to get from the artery to the vein. And so we have this system that allows it to bypass the capillaries. Any questions? So, not only does this happen, remember these arteries are also going to vasoconstrict and vasodilate. And that's what this is. Look, if the tissues are active, that artery is going to vasodilate. And more blood is going to go to that organ. But if it's inactive, what's going to happen is that vessel is going to constrict. We're going to vas vasoconstriction. And less blood is going to go to that organ. Okay, let's look at venues. So if we're talking about veins. Well, when we looked at arteries, arteries start out big and then they divide. So we get a smaller artery. So they divide, and then they divide again, and we get an even smaller artery. And they divide again, and we get an even smaller artery. So the first arteries are the biggest ones. But then remember, we're going to go into capillaries. 
And then we're going to go into veins. But veins are the opposite. Veins start out small and then they merge. So this vein merges with that vein, which merges with that vein, until eventually you get the very largest veins. So they're the opposite. So the first veins are the smallest veins. And the smallest veins are called venules. So venules form when the capillary beds unite. So if we go back to our picture, here is a venule right here. So that's venue. That's our venue right there, the very smallest veins. Those are the venules. Well, remember we said that if you look at an artery, there are three walls. One, two, three. Tunica media, tunica interna, tunica externa. And then we said that if you look at a capillary, remember there's only just one layer. And that's our tunica interna. And we said that if you look at the arteriole, there are two layers. So we went from three to two to one. Three to two to one. And remember the layers that we had here were the tunica media and the tunica interna. Everybody's got an interna. And then we're going to head into these veins. Well, veins also have three layers. We already looked at that. They have a tunica externa, tunica media, tunica interna, tunica externa, tunica media, tunica interna. So somehow now we have to get back from one back up to three. And so what's going to happen is our venules are going to gain a layer. They also have two layers. They gain a layer. But they're not the same two layers as in an arterio. Over here we have a tunica externa and a tunica interna. So two layers. So when we look at one of these, we have a tunica externa, tunica media. So if we remember the tunica externa is where we're going to have this collagen and elastin, and then this tunica media, or sorry, I back up. We don't have a tunica media. So the two layers we have are the tunica externa, that's where we have this collagen and maybe some elastin, and the tunica interna, these two layers. So if we look at an arteriole versus a venue, they look very different. There's an arteriole. Look how thick the walls are. That's because they have all that smooth muscle. There's a venue, and look how thin the walls are. Look at these venules. They're tiny. No smooth muscle hardly at all. And because they don't have very much smooth muscle, they cannot do vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Look, there's the arteriole and there's a venue. There's a, those are venules. There's an arteriole. These are venules. And so, when we look at it here, here's our venue. And so they all have the same tunica interna, and then here's this tunica externa. Now some venules, the very largest ones, may have a little bit of smooth muscle, but they don't have anywhere near the smooth muscle that arterioles do. But some of the largest venules have a little bit of smooth muscle. But still, because it's so little, they are not good at doing vasoconstriction, vasodilation. They can't really do that at all.
And then from venules, we're going to go into veins. So let's look at veins. We've already looked at them a little bit. Remember, they have three layers. Well, there are actually three different types of veins, too, but this is very easy. They're just named small, medium, and large. So there's really nothing to learn when you talk about their names. They're all identical except for their size. They all have three layers. They all have this thin tunica media, which means they have very little smooth muscle. If you don't have smooth muscle, you can't do vasoconstriction and vasodilation. They're very bad at it. They have a thick tunica externa, though. And remember, there's elastin and collagen in here. And so what happens when a vein fills up with blood is the walls bulge out. And so a lot of blood can be put into a vein because it'll just bulge. So we can actually store blood in a vein. In fact, at any one point in time, about two-thirds of all of your blood is in the systemic veins. So if we want to get more blood, if we need more blood to pump, this is where it's going to come from. So we just finished talking about the heart. And remember when we talked about the heart, we used a, an equation, cardiac output equals heart rate times EDV minus ESV. So EDV is how much blood that's in the heart before it's going to pump. Well, where does that blood come from? It comes from the veins. And so if we start exercising, more blood comes from the veins. And if more blood comes there, we're going to have a bigger EDV. And if we have a bigger EDV, we're going to have a bigger cardiac output. So when you exercise, you force the blood out of the veins and into the heart. And so the heart has more blood to pump, and so it pumps more blood. If we look at a vein, here are those layers. There's the tunica interna, very thin layer. But look, there's the tunica media. It's also a very thin layer. And there's our tunica externa, much, much, much thicker. Same thing over here. You can see the externa, and you can see the media, and there's the interna. That's the artery. Look how thick it is. But look over here at the vein, externa. Look how thin the media is. And then there's the interna. And so if we look at a vein, look, there's externa. You can see it very easily. Look how thin the media is. And look how little amount of smooth muscle there is. There's not very much. Now we have a lot of collagen. And that collagen in this externa is what's going to support the vessel and why it bulges out. Any questions? One other thing, when we look at it, here's our artery in our vein. Again, see that thin tunica media? Another thing about veins is the blood pressure is very, very low. In fact, we already know this because we looked at the graph of a blood pressure. Remember that graph of blood pressure looks like this. When you're close to the heart, it goes up and down. But the further and further and further you get away from the heart, it turns into a straight line. And by the time you get to the veins, the very largest veins, the blood pressure is zero.
zero. So the blood pressure is very, very low. In fact, the blood pressure is so low that there's not enough pressure to push the blood around. And so veins need help. And one of the things that helps veins is that they have valves. So if we look at a vein, they have valves. They have valves. If we go back to this other picture here. There's the valve right there. They're little tiny infoldings of this simple squamous epithelium. So they're not thick. Look how thin that is. They're not very strong either. In fact, you can't even see a valve with your naked eye. That's how thin they are. But what they do is they keep the blood from flowing backwards. So when the heart pumps and blood flows, it flows this way. But when it tries to go backwards, look, the valve closes and the blood can't. But look at these valves. These valves don't work anymore. They're incompetent. And so when the blood tries to go backwards, these valves leak. Well, what tends to happen is there's going to be more blood that collects in the bottom of the artery. And that's going to bulge out even more than it usually does. So, those are veins. So, here's a little quiz for you. A little self-quiz. I'll tell you this one, I already said before, but that's a nerve, so don't worry about that one. But you should be able to identify all of these different parts in here. You should be able to tell which of these is an artery, which of these is a vein. You should be able to name the layers. Now, D represents this tissue here. You might should remember that, too. That's adipose. But it's sort of a self-quiz. Well, blood vessels, remember, are where the blood travels. And so if you only have one pathway for the blood to go, if you block it, there's nowhere for the blood to go. So sometimes... We have these little alternate pathways for blood to go. And so that looks a little bit like this. And so the blood can go this way or this way or this way. These are called anastomoses. So an anastomosis is an alternate pathway for the blood to travel to get to a particular area. So if one is blocked, the blood can flow around it. So the blood can go this way. But if that one's blocked, it could go this way. Unfortunately, we have very few anastomoses. There's not very many of them. And so if we do get a blocked blood vessel, usually it's going to cause pain and it's going to cause injury, and it could even cause death unless you do something to fix it because we don't have very many of these anastomoses. It's too bad. Maybe we should have more, but we don't. So that's the end of the first part of blood vessels. So the second part we're going to pick up tomorrow. So I hope you join me for that. Anybody have any questions? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop recording there.